I am on a mission. It's not a mission impossible. It's not a mission with Bezos uh, to faith, to space. It's not a dreaded mission statement in the workplace. God, I am on a mission. I join in with a mission. I, Nick Griffin, am part of the mission of God. Today, may I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, 12 weeks ago, we started our journey, our series, looking at the mission of God. And today we mark the conclusion of the series. We've explored the five different marks of mission, looking at the different ways in which God is working out his plans in the world. Now, I've taught this topic, I've preached on this topic, uh, and I've prayed into it deeply, but I cannot escape the vision in my mind. Whenever I hear the word, I still can't get that missionary slashing through the undergrowth uh, out of my head. You know, he's got a pith hat, he's got a big machete in his hand, and I can't get him out of my head whatsoever. I don't know what mi- image you have in your mind when you hear the word mission. Now, for me, there are loads of problems with this, this image that I've got in my mind. Uh, firstly, the guy's male when most of the modern missionary movement was begun with females. Uh, what happened was, really quickly, what happened was uh, the church, church in England said, you can't lead anything, you can't do anything, you can't teach anything, you can't preach and you can't be ordained, and, but you can go abroad. And so what happens is they burst out and the modern missionary movement was began. Uh, also, with that mission, missionary, for some reason, he's got an enormous moustache. I can't, I can't abide that, but there we are. It's always very well trimmed in my mind. It's also wrong because it can be so patronizing to other people groups, the sense that we just go and sort people out in some ways. But what's the real problem with this image? Is that the image of mission that I was just described to you there, the missionary going through the jungle with his machete, is centered on human activity. Like we do mission. Like we go and we save people. And mission in that mode is so wrong because it becomes a point of pride. Uh, Like us rich people saving poor or the other way around, it becomes the need is so enormous, so blooming impossible. I get overwhelmed at the sheer level of need. And I think, what's the point? I just can't do it. I can't remotely help with it. I should just go and have a lie down and find myself somewhere quietly in a room. Charities talk about it as compassion fatigue, compassion fatigue, where people can see the need, they know the need, but they think, I just can't do it all. I give up. You must have felt that uh, once or twice where a job becomes too much and you just can't even begin. The mission of God is totally different. And I was praying, I was like, Lord, I had a really clear idea about where this this series was going to go. Really clear idea, you know, the five marks and all that stuff. We were going to do them twice. It's great. And then this last one, Bethan said to me, what are you going to do with this last one? And I went, I I don't know. And I was praying about it. I was walking around the park with the dogs. And I remembered. God always leads back to God. That is, it's not my job to save the world. It's not my job to save the church. It's not my job to save Taunton. Bible says we can't even save ourselves. We aren't the savior. We just know the savior. That is, God is already working. God is already saving. God is already inviting you and me to join in with his work. In our text today, we're thinking about the response that Jesus gave to the lawyer when the man asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Do you remember it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Now, these phrases are so well known. I'm going to focus on the little commentary that surrounds them that Jesus himself gives. First, Jesus says, this is the first and greatest commandment. This is the first and greatest commandment. You know, friends, churches do so much stuff. Uh, Some people, uh, you know, my dad sometimes says to me, you only work on one day a week, don't you? Vickers only work one on Sunday, all that stuff. 
But then if you actually look at the churches across the country, they're running cafes, they're running jungle gyms, uh, they're running sports ministries, they're running tree planting, they're running just, they're sending cows to places, uh, they're healing this, they're blessing that. They do loads and loads of stuff. And it's all really well-intentioned. It's all really often great, uh, thoughtful, prayerful work. But sometimes the danger is all this stuff around us that the stuff itself becomes the focus and we forget who we really are. We forget what's really at the centre. Uh, Pete Gregg, a uh, big national speaker, ran a big church. He was growing a church. He had all the activities under the sun going on. And he realised one day that if God didn't show up, if the Holy Spirit wasn't really at work, then it was so professional. It was so slick. It was so shiny that they wouldn't even notice that God had left them, had, wasn't blessing them, wasn't with them, because they were just doing it all themselves. And this revelation led him to start the 24-7 prayer movement that released so much prayer across the world, enormous bursting out. I once spoke to a colleague of mine when I was a university chaplain who said, when I do the God bit, nobody's interested. But when I do the well-being, life is groovy and cool, uh, bit they come in droves and it begs the question what is our calling of the church to be successful to get bums on seats to gather millions in a really interesting study is to look at how Jesus himself relates to the crowds what does Jesus say our first calling is to love the Lord your God with all of yourselves to love the Lord your God with all of yourself, heart, soul, and mind. It's not indicating that somehow there's a different bit of us, heart, soul, and mind is somehow different, but that all of us, every inch and globule of your being is devoted to, to God. So where, when, it, when we talk about the mission of God, uh, where does it lead to? Where is it going? It always leads us back to God. God always leads us to more of himself. As Rome, it says in Romans, the riches and depths, is, depths of God, inexhaustible, unimaginable, unspeakable, that whatever we do, we are sent out by God to lead people back to God. Not just to get people here, but to lead them to the Lord. But let's also look at that little linking phrase between the first and second command. The second command is like it. So Jesus says himself, the second command is like it. That is, there is a relationship between the first and the second command. How can you love God who is invisible, intangible, beyond all things? Friends, as we love the Lord, as we pray more, as we study more, as we praise more, we find ourselves being sent into joining in with what God is doing. You can't pray the prayer, give us this day our daily bread with the Lord's pray, uh, prayer every day, and then not think about those who are hungry. You know, those guys in, who in the history of the church have tried the hardest to go into the depths of God, who have devoted them their whole selves to the Lord. And I don't even mean like me, you know, like the vicars, I mean like, like the, the elite level guys, you know, the, the ones who've gone into the desert and lived up a pole all their life. Those who have bricked themselves and themselves and lived in, um, lived in monasteries, they find themselves giving out again. That the deeper they go into prayer, the more they have to give out. It's a bit like a spring. The harder you push into the depths of God, the more you'll be propelled outwards towards the work of God in the world. So the love of God, the love of God that we find bubbling up in ourselves, then overflows into love for neighbour. So that we love our God then by loving our neighbour. And we love our neighbour by loving our Lord. They aren't competing. They are always complementing. Now we've looked at those five marks of mission and they're called marks because they're not meant to compete with one another but all show signs of being part of God's whole mission to redeem creation. And the church is one of those few places where there's a chance for genuine diversity. 
So there will be those of you who have particular passions. Within our own congregation, within five minutes of meeting Carol, I knew about her passion for the environment. Instantly, as soon as I met our lovely Rachel Neal, who perhaps may be one of the loveliest human beings ever to be born ever, uh, you knew of her compassion for people. Now, independently, they probably represent that passion for uh, treasuring creation and tending the vulnerable, both different marks of mission. Now, in some church meetings, what you'll get, and you'll get this when churches work together, you'll get people who need to say, all that other stuff is rubbish. We need to go out into the streets and to preach the gospel and to bring them all in. And then you'll get others saying, that's entirely terrifying. I never want to do that in my life. But I really want to visit the lonely and the vulnerable to tend them. And these aspects, they don't compete. They're just different aspects of the same mission of God to draw his creation back to himself, to tell, to teach, to transform, to tend, to treasure. They're all complementary and our church will emphasise different ways of loving our neighbours at different times. But this is what separates us from every other organisation on the planet. It will always lead back to the Lord. When um, I'll tell you a story before I close. Uh, when I used to work for the YMCA, um, the YMCA is an awesome organization. But one of the things that broke my heart was uh, sometimes we'd get residents and we'd set them up and we'd take them through the mentoring program and uh, they'd end up with their benefits sorted on an educational program. They'd get a flat and then they'd move out and you'd be like, yes, they've done it, success, tick the box, fantastic. And it would break my heart because they'd, come back again six months later and start back again at the beginning. And I remember going, oh, it's not more stuff that these people need. They do need that. There's, it's more than that. There's this inner transformation that's required. They need somewhere to live. They need something to do. They need food in their bellies, but they also need the Lord. And whatever we do, if it's loving our, loving our creation, whether it's transforming our society, whether it's visiting the lonely and looking after the sick, whether it's teaching in home groups, whether it's proclaiming in the streets, all will lead back to the Lord. That's what makes us distinctive as a church, Wilton. That is who we are. Our focus is on the Lord. And this mission of God is bigger than me. The ministry of Wilton Church is bigger than me. I am the vicar, but my job is not to do everything. Hallelujah, because it would be rubbish if I did. But to help steer this community to love our neighbours, to love our Lord. And my prayer is that God will be stirring your hearts to raise up new ministries, to raise up new passions, that some of your hearts will break to go and tell the gospel, to go and share it out with Alpha courses on the streets in door to door. That some of you, will, your hearts will be broken to tend to the sick and the lonely, the vulnerable, those in need. That some of you will just say, I see that in our society. Maybe it's food or whatever issue. It needs changing. It needs transformation. Some of you will say, I just feel like I've got a passion to teach. I have bubbling up inside me. I'm a teacher. I feel most myself in life when I'm teaching. Um, and some of you say, I just want to look after this creation we've been given. I want to bring people along to treasure this gorgeous creation. You don't need one of these uh, one of these bits of plastic to get involved. That you are baptized today, that you love the Lord, will lead you to the lost, to the broken, to the hungry. And the mission of God will take you out. And then it will come back again. And like a, it will continually go backwards and forwards for God is on a mission. Did you hear that, Wilton? Say it at home with me. God is on a mission. The rocket is fueled and he's bought you a ticket. The question is, will you get on board? Will you get on board? Brothers and sisters, let's go. Let's pray now. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your mission that you have not left your creation to rot. But instead, Lord, you have brought us on and say, come with me, join in, 
Stir up our hearts young, stir up our hearts old, stir up our hearts everything in between, Lord, and bring out what you're going to do amongst us. Bring it out, Lord. May fresh ministries grow up. I pray for those who are watching this. Some of them will be ordained in the future. Some of them will be offering new ministries and doing things they never thought they would do before. Lord, bless those people. And I pray that you would be strumming that call in their heart now. And I pray, Lord, that you would be bringing those up, bubbling them up, and that we would be able to use them and bless them this day. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Work amongst us, we ask. We are open to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.